Cohn, and today I am with a guest who I am so excited to visit with, and I know you are going to love today's conversation. I am so grateful and excited to have Dr. Lisa Demore with us. If you're not familiar with Lisa, she's a psychologist, best-selling author. She writes a monthly New York Times column and is a regular contributor to CBS News. She has two wonderful books that are just you know, they're required reading if you are a parent. Untangled, Guiding Teenage Girls Through the Seven Transitions into Adulthood. There's another book, Under Pressure, Confronting the Epidemic of Stress and Anxiety in Girls, which you should definitely check out. I, I've been listening to the audio book. I really enjoy it. And Lisa narrates it. And she has a wonderful, soothing voice, but also really helps you to just understand the pressures that, that, that girls are dealing with. But it's not only girls, because you might say, oh, you know, I don't have a girl, I, I have boys. Like this stuff's relevant. Lisa has a podcast, the Ask Lisa podcast, which is phenomenal. And I really encourage you to check out where she answers lots of different questions and goes deep into so many of the topics that we're not gonna dive as deep into today. She also has a private practice, which I was thinking, how cool would it be if Lisa was your therapist? And she directs the Laurel School Center for Research on Girls, which integrates its own studies with the latest findings. When she is at home, she also has to practice. She has to practice as a mother of two daughters, a teenage daughter and a preteen. And she also has a partner, a husband who helps her with that. So, oh, I am just so excited. I mean, you can tell, I really, I really am pumped uh, to have Dr. Lisa Demore with us today. Welcome, Lisa. Thank you. That is such a lovely introduction. I'm really, really glad to be with you. Well, you know, you're a person. And mm -hmm. the thing is, you're so knowledgeable and you're so wonderful at communicating and helping parents and, and helping teenagers understand themselves. But, but, you know, you as a person, I've been really trying to get to know you. And I know you also are, are a clinician. So, you know, how much you offer, you know, you might be careful in what you're sharing, but I was trying to find something of you yelling. <laughs> you know, I, I was something of you losing your temper. And I was like, even thinking like, is there social media? Is there, is there a game where you just lose it? Is there something like your partner? You know, does, 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 your, does he have like social media where it's like, oh, look at Lisa at home. <laughs> but like, where do we see you yelling? You know, if I'm gonna be angry in a less than appropriate way, I will do passive aggression. Oh, very yeah. good. I, Psychological I, that's, that's, when I'm not at my best, that's where I go. And yeah. the good thing about being a parent, and I write about this, is you know your kids call you on the carpet. Mm -hmm. And um, so I have had to get a lot more honest with myself about the fact that when I am super annoyed, it will go in the passive aggressive direction where I will say things that are uh, maybe a little bit guilt inducing or playing the part of a victim or something like that. And um, this is why it's so fun to have kids because they just, you know, especially as they are in adolescence or moving into it. So the other day, my younger daughter was like, all right, everybody pack your bags. We're going on a guilt trip. <laughs> so they, I would they say, smell it. yeah, anger is not my thing, but passive aggressive when I'm, I'm not being my best. That's where I will go. Yeah, that's interesting. I'm good at that. Like I'm great <laughs> at the psychological, uh, you know, I would say warfare. Um, cause I won't, I wouldn't lay a hand on my kid and I'm, and I've gotten better. I, I've gotten better at, um, not shaming them, um, because there's a directive, uh, then there's the thing after, you know, like clean your room. It's really messy. And then it's, I don't know why I spend money buying you clothes. Right. <laughs> yep, yep. So we've, we've really tried to, it's, it's been good and it's been bad. Well, we've talked a lot about shame in our house and I have a 17, I have not a 17 year old, I have a 15 year old, I've got my, my 12 year old and I've got my seven year old. And when we talk to each other, we, we will call out, you know, why are you shaming him? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it's been really fascinating because they'll talk to each other about shaming at the dinner table, but then they'll talk to us. They'll be like, I get it. Now you're shaming me. Yeah. Yeah. Which has been fascinating. It when is, and you know, shame doesn't usually have a place in family life. Guilt does, you know, and so the way I think about it is guilt is about the thing you did, shame is about who you are. So I think it's okay to say to kids like, what'd you do? Like, that is so not like you, like that's not okay what you did. Like what you did, like you can go ahead and feel guilty about that. And actually the discomfort of the guilt should help you from doing that thing again. But 
the line we don't want to cross as parents is into shame where we say like, what's wrong with you, right? right? So that's the distinction. Like, I don't like what you did versus I have questions about who you are. We don't want to go here. But what about, what about the part where you pile on where, where someone makes a decision that's a, not the best choice. And then there's the piece after that that says, I thought you were, you know, I thought you were, were better than that. I thought you knew better. Like mm-hmm. the thought I knew better, is that guilt or is that shame? I think it's getting into shame. And I, I think because it's like, I thought like I, I, mis, I misunderstood your character, right? Is sort of what's implied in that. But the other problem with that is kids live up to expectations and they live down to expectations. So there's sort of this, you know, oh, I thought you knew better. It's like, oh, I'm now realizing you're here. Whereas if you say, look, what you did, that is not like you. I know you're not comfortable with what just happened. It's yeah. basically saying, I don't like what you did. And I see you as someone who has higher standards than that. Let's go back to those standards. So I have this conversation with my wife. And I actually had this conversation right before our conversation. I was talking to uh, a, a parent who's hosting a program and uh, a counselor who, who we're hosting a program with. And I said, I'm going to share something with you that I don't really share publicly but I guess I am sharing it publicly. <laughs> Here you go. But I wanted to share it with you. And I said, you know what? I'm, t- I'm talking to, to Lisa later. And they were so excited that I was talking <laughs> to you. And I said, you know, I want to bring this up to her and get her take on it. And I said, I am really more concerned about this fall than I've been concerned about any year prior to this one. Because we know the data. You know, we know that there's a record number of students who are dealing with anxiety and stress and they're coming out of this more anxious and, and, and more overwhelmed. And I know that there's, there's data to, to back that up. And in a typical year, we have students who really struggle with this transition. Mm-hmm. And now we have everything that happened before. So there's this jarring transition that so many students are still reeling from and trying to recover from they're then put into a new situation where they don't have their people, they don't have their places, they're dealing with all of the changes that a regular student deals with who struggles, plus they're dealing with what happened over the past 18 months. They're used to being around family, they're used to being close to the people who love them the most and care for them the most, and many of them don't have that that support system in place and then, and I know you've spoken a lot about this, we have the students who aren't as, as practiced socially. Another, I had another conversation with a student who said, I'm a little worried about the fall because I've been cooped up that I'm afraid I'm gonna let loose. I worry about that. Yeah, so we have those who aren't as practiced, taking mm-hmm. risks, which is, a, which is a typical situation we deal with every year. Then we have those who are so ready to get out there. Then we have these feelings that so many students really weren't able to process. And then we have this, this college where everything opens up. And then the other part, and I know this is about you, but I wanna put this, like, I want, I wanna know what you think of this because the other part is, the other part is COVID has been an excuse. You know, yeah. for me, for me personally, like for my business, if my business isn't as good, COVID. It's not that I'm not a hard worker. It's not that I, I'm not as disciplined. It's COVID. You know, if there was a problem with a relationship, COVID. If there's a challenge, COVID. But now we're back in a situation where things open up and there's the appearance that everything is normal again. So if I'm dealing with challenges and struggles as, as, as a teenager who's going to college, I can't necessarily say, oh, pandemic, COVID. It's, I'm, there's something wrong with me. So all of those converging elements make me more apprehensive and uncomfortable, but also more motivated and focused to empower people with tools to help them to navigate this change. Yeah, yeah. Well, as you're talking, I'm having a thought for the first time that it feels really timely to actually start to sort this out. And I love thinking with you about it. So I think we could think about it. This is a gross oversimplification, but it's how we start to make sense of things. There's one of two paths here where kids could go. So one is, and it's the one you describe, where they are so worn down from the realities of the pandemic. I think it has been 
nothing short of brutal for teenagers. I think it has been so much harder for teenagers than it is for adults in a lot of ways. I just think the where it hits them in life, what the expectations are, I mean, what it's like to do Zoom school, I mean, all of that. So we have these super worn down kids who are coming to the end of high school. If they um, feel enormously fragile emotionally because of what they've been through, if they start to consolidate an identity as someone who is fragile and emotional, as opposed to seeing it as very context driven, if they then have a very demanding summer where there's some sense of like, um, you know, I've made, I've lost time, I should be working hard, I should, you know, I shouldn't have leisure because basically COVID was a lot of nothing, so I got to keep myself super busy. So they're already depleted and then they don't use the summer to put gas in their tank or they do use the summer to continue to avoid social relationships because they're really anxious. And then they go off to college that way. I think it could be less than ideal, right? That they show up wiped out, they show up you know, feeling really anxious, they show up not having practiced social skills again. And I think some kids may feel overwhelmed by the demands of college, which like you say, college is a stressful transition under ideal conditions. Some kids may manage that by collapsing in on themselves. Other kids may manage that by acting out. And I do worry, I have the same concern that there are some kids where they feel like, I worry they may feel like I need to go hog wild when I get to college to make up for all this lost time. And we all know those kids who already showed up in college with this idea that like, if you do college right, you like are drunk all the time. That wasn't good before. That's not gonna be good now. I think some kids may feel that added pressure. Okay, so that's the path. Right that's concerning. I think there's another path. And I think there are things that adults can do to help kids get on this path. Great. And I think there's a lot of hope and promise on this path. Okay, so first of all, I hope that there are a lot of kids and families who take this pandemic as an opportunity to redefine mental health. Not as something where you're mentally healthy when you feel calm and relaxed all the time. That's a horrible definition. We came into the pandemic with it. We should not leave the pandemic with it. But to redefine mental health as you are mentally healthy when you have the right feeling at the right time and you have the skills to manage it. So if you are anxious in a fearful situation, that is a really good thing. How do you manage that anxiety? How do you keep yourself safe? How do you contain your anxiety? If you feel stressed about the transition to college, that makes sense. It's a stressful transition because there's so much new. How do you manage that stress? Do you go get very drunk or do you reach out to someone who is supportive and loving and get some guidance. And so you manage the stress effectively. So one thing that could come out of this pandemic is a vastly improved understanding of what mental health is. And it's not that you feel good all the time. And if we can change that definition, kids will feel much better in general. We came into this with this sense of like, you're not supposed to feel bad, which made kids feel bad all the time. So that's one thing. The second thing on this path is they should be more resilient now. We know this. When people go through hard experiences, we have data upon data about this. If they are able to weather those experiences, they are more resilient in the face of new difficulties. There is a narrative here where having gone through the pandemic and how horrible, truly horrible it was, that most of what comes at kids after this will feel like small potatoes. There is a narrative here where kids show up at college, like throw anything at me you want, I have been through the worst. I don't like this professor. I don't like my roommate. You know what? I did 15 months in a global pandemic. I can do three months in a class I don't like. And so I think if we can go down that track of it's stressful and you can handle it because clearly you can handle a lot. Don't expect to feel good all the time. Don't take that as a sign that something's wrong with you. It may actually be evidence of your mental health if you're having the right feeling at the right time. You have coping capacities that you have discovered out of sheer necessity and you are more durable than you have ever been, that could be a good trajectory into college. I, lo- I love that. And that's, okay. that, that was the, I gave you the doom and gloom before. Mm-hmm. And, and the second part is exactly, exactly what you're talking about. And, and what's been really fascinating is because everybody has been so, uncomfortable, no, really forced outside their comfort zone. People who live in protected communities who tend to not experience this until later in life, uh, they've been uncomfortable. Mm-hmm. And, and then of course, there's those who have been even more uncomfortable from underrepresented communities and, and under-resourced populations, which you know, just taking care of basic needs has been so difficult. But that piece of everybody's had a chance to practice. Yep. You know. Yep more so than ever before in a way that nobody wanted, 
So when you were practicing, and what's so cool about this is I see so many students who get uncomfortable for the first time when they're dealing with that change to college. And now the, the change that they dealt with this past year was, was really similar in many ways, you know, of like losing their people, losing their places, getting impatient, having to advocate, figuring out, you know, how do you find joy in your life independent of other people and other things? And, and that's been a, and that's been a big, a, a big question that I ask students that when you're going to college, how can you leave with something that you can do that gives you joy independent of other people and other things, hopefully something that you discovered during the pandemic? Yep. You know, that's the, the joy of that. Another thing students have learned a lot more about is how to motivate themselves when they have no motivation, right? That, that since October, mm -hmm. motivation has been in the toilet. And I've watched a lot of kids dig deep, learn strategies, gack, hacks, and gimmicks that like let them get work done when they do not have any energy to get work done, they can take that to college. Yeah. They have work they don't want to do. And so there, the way we want to think about it is humans make meaning. We tell stories about what's happened. We, we, we create narratives. And, and I think adults in the lives of young people can help with the narrative. And the narrative might be like, you're fragile. You have suffered. You're still suffering. This has been frightening. And we're, we now worry about your ability to manage your own emotions. Or the narrative can be, okay, like you say, Harlan, like no one got out of this thing unscathed. Everyone came up against sides of themselves that they had never had to know before, discomfort that may have been all new to them. Everyone got a chance to figure out how they navigate that effectively, how much power they have to actually get through hard situations. They can take that, put it in the bank and go to college on it. Yeah. That can be the other narrative. And I think we should, really give kids a chance to rest, restore, process, and create a narrative that sends them off to college feeling good. Yeah. And I, I think of what you're saying, I mean, it's so important of what's that story going to be? What's your child's story going to be? What's your story going to be? And I think so many people are still recovering from the trauma mm -hmm. and, and are so shaken up that they don't even have a moment to process or think about it because they're going to blink and it's going to be the next thing that's coming their way. So I really want this to be a reminder and I love, I love, I love how you are exploring and sharing and helping people to understand the definition of, of mental health or a, or a healthier definition of mental health. That means you're going to feel something and feeling something negative doesn't mean you have poor mental health. It just means you're going through a situation that doesn't necessarily feel good and change is often associated with those feelings. So that's okay. Negative feelings are data. That is all they are. Every time I'm with this person, I feel terrible. That's data. <laughs> like you want to follow those data. Like you want to pay attention to that information. Um, psychologists are agnostic on negative feelings. They're as much data as what feels good. It's all data. Yeah, I, I, I've been, I, I like sharing um, the expression, information is not emotional. Yeah. And, you know, we attach the emotion to it. But, but this is the part where it's so tricky because you have so many teenagers who have been keeping their feelings to themselves and so many of them who have been struggling and so many of them who process information as emotion. Every year under normal conditions, I watch the eighth graders become so anxious on the way out the door because they are so nervous about how they're entering high school and where they're going to fit in. And we see all of this like nonsense behavior at the end of eighth grade as kids are trying to like jockey for position. They have some idea that like how I leave eighth grade, like determines how I enter ninth grade, which of course it doesn't. But um, that's under totally typical conditions. Yeah. You take that and then you throw the ambiguities of the pandemic on it, the opaque quality that took over their social lives where they have no idea where they fit in, no idea what people think of them. That is a major appropriate developmental concern. And they were spinning. I mean, if I describe seventh, eighth, and maybe ninth graders who didn't have well-established friendships, they have spent spinning for months. And then they've had so much time to think and spin and dwell and become anxious. And then when they become anxious, they go look at social media. And the upshot of that is they feel more anxious because everybody else seems to be having fun. Everybody else seems to be socializing. 
And it has just been, oh, Harlan, I mean, I, I work, my work is to try to reduce suffering in adolescence. And I feel like the suffering that I have seen and the suffering that I know is out there that is underground yeah. in this. And that actually, I will tell you the thing I like, what's keeping me up at night now is I, I think there is, it is so much worse than we know. And I'm usually on the side of being very reassuring. Everybody's overreacting. I'm like, we have no idea how bad this has been for teenagers because so much of it has been happening sequestered away from adults, away from teachers, away from coaches. I think there's gonna be a long tail from the mental health side to this pandemic. Yeah, and and that's that's where you know I feel like everybody's excited and we should be excited and it's wonderful. But you know, I am I am I am worried and 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 it's helpful to talk to you to hear, you know, you're you're concerned about that too. Cause I think the the part where these students who got through it, like this is kind of how it is. Like I have eating issues. I've always had eating issues since I was a kid. I was a really overweight kid. And on the weekends when I'm around family and there's lots of good food and temptation. And if I'm in a place where I'm really trying to balance myself and I have a therapist who I talk to and, you know, and I journal about this and I have all my stuff. So, you know, um, but then so Sunday, I'm really good. But then, and then Monday comes along mm -hmm. and I will eat all the leftovers. Mm -hmm. And I'll eat those things that I didn't eat mm -hmm. on Saturday and Sunday because it's Monday and Mondays are hard. And yep. I feel like Monday's coming. Yeah, I think that's right. I think that's right. I think there's a lot of coming to terms that we have to do, a lot of sorting out. I will also say, I mean, I know you were using it as a metaphor, eating concerns in the pandemic have been rampant. Yeah. Um, eating disorders, I wrote a column titled Eating Disorders Have Exploded in the Pandemic. And, and I will tell you, Harlan, that one was, I didn't see it coming. Like when, when everything started yeah. shut down, I was like, I am worried about substance abuse. I am worried about depression. I am worried about suicidality. Eating disorders were sort of over here for me. I have to tell you, they have become front and center. There are so many, we are seeing boys and girls really, really struggling with their bodies. The other thing that makes me so anxious about this is eating disorders are sticky. That mm -hmm. if a person really um, develops a pretty significant eating concern, it's hard to shake. It can be something that they're dealing with for a very long time. And so um, I worry. I yeah. worry about kids who picked up an eating disorder in this pandemic and that's gonna be the lasting legacy for them of the pandemic. Yeah. And I want to be really positive. And I feel like, you know, there's been some alarms just in this conversation, but I feel that it's not authentic if I'm not being honest. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, and, 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 and with every concern, I believe there is a path and, and an answer and tools. And for those of you who are just tuning in um, with Dr. Lisa Demore and Dr. Lisa has this wonderful podcast. And I'm going to link to your podcast because the thing I love about your podcast is it's prescriptive advice mm -hmm. and suggestions mm -hmm. that will help work through these, these challenges. So whatever, you know, you as a, as a, as a listener are going through really checking that out because there are answers to this and there are people who can help you and there are places where you can find support. So as a parent who's out there, and, and I just also want to say, there's going to be more people that are balanced, that are thriving, that are healthy, that are, that are just gonna have the most incredible time to take these lessons and, and apply it. And I think that collectively, as we get five, 10 years down the line, I think this generation of teenagers is going to change the world, change the world because of this and how they got through it. Like I'm like bracing myself, cause I know it. I'm with you. I mean, they are gonna be on fire and I can't wait to see what they do unstoppable but it's just getting them through this like this yeah. time so that they can see it and recognize it and with our remaining time I really want to help parents and I want to help teenagers who are going through this and they're like Harlan yeah I'm dealing with this you know Lisa this is what I'm dealing with because I think there are so many we know so many who are secretly dealing with this and don't want to share this so my kid you know I love my kids so much uh, but I do know what it's like to have someone close the door and not want to talk to me and I'm dealing with this, like I'm living it. Like I go to schools 
and people really love me. And then I go home and it's like, <laughs> I know. knock, knock, knock. Like I know a few things. Do you yeah. deal with this too? Like do your kids, do, do they close the door on you? Do, can you actually share or do you have to just sometimes just be like, I just can't, you know, there, there's no window. They're not letting me. Yeah. Um, it's an interesting thing to be a psychologist and a mom. And um, I will tell you, I, I pretty much check my hat at the door. Like at home, I really just try to be a mom. And um, there are a lot of reasons for this. I think it's very hard to live with a parent who's treating you as though you are a patient. I think that's a hazard I watch clinicians do sometimes in their care of their own kids. It's really well-meaning, but I think it makes the kids feel like they live in an x-ray machine. Um, and I think it's also really good my husband is not a psychologist. So he's just a real practical parent. And so sometimes if I'm not entirely trusting my own instinct, I will defer to him. I'll give you an example. Um, when it was time to begin the Santa Claus myth with my older daughter, uh, she was like two or three. I was like, do we lie? Do we lie to her about Santa Claus? Like, it feels like it's a breach in the relationship. And he's like, listen, we lie. And here's why. We do more damage to that kid if she's the one kid on the playground who ruins it for everybody as opposed to we play along with this for a while. And I'm like, okay, you know, like I'll buy, I'll buy that. Right. But um, they do, you know, kids deserve privacy and they want privacy. And a big part of the job of becoming um, a teenager is to become independent. And there's a fairly bizarre scenario where we expect kids to become independent while living in our homes and being entirely dependent on us for their basic needs. So usually that does take the form of a closed door, a lot more um, privacy, a lot more annoyance with us finding everything we do to be really, really um, dumb is <laughs> basically the way I would describe it. And I think the goal as a parent is to not take it personally, to not hold a grudge, to draw lines about how people can act in your house. You know, you can't be rude, you can't be a jerk. Like, I don't treat you that way, you cannot treat me that way. Um, and to have faith that once kids have felt like they've established some sense of separateness and autonomy and independence, they can usually then live with us quite a bit more comfortably, that they are their own people and we are not um, too enmeshed anymore. But it's a tough, I would say that 13, 14, 15 year old bridge is a tough one because they really do hold us at arm's length sometimes. It's really, it's really hard. Um... And then they go away and, you know, I've got a couple years, mm -hmm. but my heart is just so open and I am so just sympathetic to those parents who have those kids who perhaps had a tough year and the door was closed and they weren't able to get through and now their kids are going or perhaps they have a kid who has had some mental health struggles mm -hmm. in the past and they were tested and they came through, you know, really being uh, reflective and, and empowered, but now they're going away. Mm -hmm. So they're not going to see that kid at dinner and they're not going to be able to have those nonverbals and just be around that energy. Cause you know, you know, it's that energy that really tells you the story. So when you are a parent and you have a kid and, and just the, I, I, I put out this data all the time is it was a, uh, it was 50, I think, oh, 50, how do I not, it's four, it was 42, 57, about 57% 57 of students admitted feeling hopeless over the past year. This is ACHA data. So, you know, you've got about like two thirds of students who felt hopeless and you're a parent and you have a kid who is a week or two weeks into their semester and they say, you know, mom, dad, uh, I don't like this. This is awful. I want to come home now. Yeah. Lisa, what, what's the answer? Well, I, I'm so glad you're asking because this really does, is a very common and very terrifying scenario as a parent. Um, so the first thing that we want by way of framing here is that it is a normal part of adolescence to do what we call externalization. Um, it's a defense that is pretty unique to adolescents which is basically, I manage my upset feeling by making you have it instead. So it's a pretty common thing with or without a pandemic. I actually wrote about this a long time ago about doing this to my own mother, where I'll tell the story. Like I remember I was a freshman and I called her. I was like, I don't know. I don't think I, uh, this isn't really working for me. She was in Colorado where I grew up. I was in Connecticut where I was in college. 
And I was like, I kind of hate it. And I don't know how I feel about being here. All right, I hung up the phone. I rejected all her help. You know, she was like, what if you did this? No, that won't work. What if you did? No, no, you don't get it. Hung up the phone, suddenly quite a bit lighter. <laughs> I sort of felt a lot better. And then my roommate came along and we went out and we had a really good time. And the next day my mom calls and she's like, are you okay? Are you okay? And I'm like, yeah, what's wrong with you? You know? So I later learned she'd been up basically all night, totally worried about me. I think, you know, seriously contemplating, like, do I grab some sandwiches and like get in the car and drive cross country to go get my kid? And that was a classic externalization. And teenagers do this in high school too. But like you say, the kid dumps it on you, goes to their room, you feel terrible. And then an hour later you see the kid and they are clearly okay. And so you feel all right as a parent. Once they're off in college, the kid dumps it on you. They feel better. You feel terrible. And they're not responding to your texts. And the reason they're not responding to your texts is they're like, oh, no, no, you have the emotional garbage. I don't want it back. Like, I just dumped it on you for you know, a reason. Like, I don't want to talk to you. So here's what I would say to parents. In my experience, and I say this as someone who's taught at a couple of colleges, who's taken care of a lot of college kids, a full-blown crisis does not arrive overnight. Very rarely do things go from being okay to totally untenable in 24 hours. It may feel that way to a young person. The yesterday I liked college, today I need you to come get me. But if yesterday they liked college and today they need you to come get them, I would say to them, let's check in tomorrow. I love you, let's check in tomorrow. And this is barring some horrible crisis that has occurred in the 24 hours. 99.9% .9 of the time on the next day, they'll be like, yeah, I'm fine. You know, like, like, it's over, it's okay. Um, crises do arrive, they take some time to build. So I would really save my worries if the kid is day after day saying, this isn't working, this isn't working. They are using the resources around them, the resources available to them, which are ample in college settings, aren't adequate. Um, but watch out for the kid who was okay yesterday, decides they're terrible today, and feels like they're ready to give up. Mm. I would be cautious about that. Right. But the, so the kid who, the kid who is going through this and, you know, it's a couple weeks, it's a couple months because, you know, mm -hmm. we know at least from the experiences that I've had and the students I've talked to, those first three months are constant change and discomfort. And it's not till they get back their second semester where they start to really feel a sense of connection and community. So it's normal to feel that discomfort so if they want to go home the first month and then we say, you know, let's just work through it. Uh, here are the people you should contact. Here are the places you should go. And you have a kid who maybe goes once and yep. then says, you know what? I just, I just can't go again. Mm -hmm. I can't do this. It's not working. Uh, that's kind of our next level. Mm -hmm. So how do, we, how do we work through that? How do we help a parent to, to be a good partner during that phase? Well, so what I love about colleges is there's a lot of different kinds of support. So the, there's the counseling services, there's your RA, there's the dean of students, there's your advisor in the college. I mean, there are a lot of different options for support. And for some kids, it might be the counseling services. For other kids, it might be joining a theater group. You know, that um, if the first thing doesn't do the job, there are many, many other options to consider. And parents can even call the dean of students and just say, look, I'm not going to give you my name or my kid's name, but I just want to make sure we're using all the resources available. Is there anything we're missing, right? And then plug the kid in with those. But the other thing I would say by way of preventative measures, like to keep from getting into a ditch in the yeah. first semester of college, there are a couple of things you can do. Number one, this is less true for teenagers than it is for adults, but it's a good rule. The, de the best predictor of future behavior is past behavior. So if you have a kid who is unable to advocate for themselves on the way out of high school, is unable to keep themselves motivated and safe under their own steam, do not expect that something magical is going to happen between the end of high school and college where they're suddenly capable of doing these things. So one way I think about this all the time is the skills to graduate from high school are very different from the skills to succeed in college. So can your kid advocate for themselves? Can they take good care of themselves? Can they use good judgment? Can they get themselves out of bed and go to class? If that's a question mark yeah. on the way out the door, don't send them. Gap year, gap year, gap year is my advice. Yeah. So there's that. 
That's one preventative. Another preventative is lower the expectations. And here is what I mean. I know adults are well-meaning when they say to teenagers, oh my God, college, the best four years of your life. I do not like this. There's a couple of problems with this. First of all, it's a little bit depressing, right? I mean, to sort of suggest that by age 22, the nope. best is behind you, it's all downhill. Like, I don't think most adults have felt that to be true. So there's that. But the other thing is, then your kid gets to college, the transition is so hard. Like you say, like it's so stressful. There's so much adaptation, there's so much change. They have terrible days under normal conditions. Don't make it worse by giving them the impression that every day was supposed to be wonderful and they now lost one of the best days in a limited number of days. I think it helps a lot to say, you're gonna go, you will have some really good times. The beginning will be very stressful just because it's so much adaptation and change equals stress and it's basically changing everything. You'll have good days and bad days. The ratio of good to bad days will shift over time. If you set the bar there, you're already setting your kid up for success, which seems like the opposite, but it actually does help. Yeah, I, I think a parent who understands the process and that's where with your books, mm -hmm. it's so wonderful because you do help a parent to get comfortable with the uncomfortable so that they can be present and allow their kids to feel what they're feeling. Mm -hmm. And if it's a feeling that doesn't feel good to you, well, there are gonna be those types of feelings that are part of the natural process that are yep. part of change. So a parent who can recognize that, and that's where you know I really try to be a good a good partner and a, and a good journalist to in, to inform them. Uh, gosh, I could I could talk to you for the next hour. There's so many questions that I have, and I, I can't believe how quickly time has flown. I want to I want to I want to you for your work because I think that like I just want to rest on this for a minute. Like I think your work, like what you do, that's so important is that you are realistic, like that you lay out the realities of how this is gonna unfold and how one can navigate this successfully. And, and that to me feels like the gift is just to pull back the veil and say, this is rough, there are yeah. bumps, there are challenges, because then when they come about, people aren't freaked out about the fact that it's happening. It's just happening, it has to be dealt with. And so I'm so grateful for what you do to help people know what's coming. Yeah, well, well thank you for that. And, and I think that, you know, the rejection piece. I, I want to do this again where we talk. I want to talk just for a full hour about rejection because I am, I'm, gonna, I'm obsessed with rejection and everything we talked about is rejection. I mean, it's related to rejection and helping students to be armed and equipped and to understand the universal rejection truth, this idea that not everyone and everything will always respond to me the way I want. And that's normal and it's beautiful and it's part of the process. I feel like, you know, that's that's the cape, that's yep. the superpower, and that's where we want to take them. And you you are wonderful at helping people to face rejection, and to acknowledge. You shared a wonderful example. I, I was lucky enough to be in on your on your live discussion recently, where you shared a story. It might have been from your book, where there was a daughter whose parents. Are you find out that the daughter's holding a secret that her mom is having an affair mm -hmm. and she is keeping this a secret mm -hmm. and your suggestion is to find other things to help cope that give you pleasure mm -hmm. and joy because you're not going to be able to change your parents and how they interact. Mm -hmm. And to me, that was the universal rejection truth of being in a family and of having parents sometimes your parents are just not going to get along and you won't be able to change that. Yep. And when that happens, how do you cope with that? But I, I, I love that. I love so much of what you do. And, and, and uh, I really encourage everybody to check out Untangled. And not only if you are a, a, a parent of, of, a, of a daughter, you know, a parent of, of sons, you know, this is so wonderful. And also under pressure, I really encourage you to pick both these up. If you're not a reader, I'm a terrible reader. Lisa, I talked to my psychologist uncle about this because mm -hmm. uh, I felt a lot of guilt that I'm an author. Mm -hmm. I had a lot of success, but I struggle reading books and I wasn't smart enough. <laughs> so, so I would listen to them, I'd listen to the books. And you know what he said? You probably know what he said. He said, he said you're consuming the books. You're great. You're reading the book. Who cares? Yeah, who cares? You get it. Yeah. Right, I felt like a fraud. But these are wonderful audiobooks. I have a rejection story that's a good one about 
kids going off to college and and maybe giving some protection because that feels like a rejection to a lot of parents when their kids are ready to go especially when the kids are super excited to go and the parent is like heartbroken about it and um you know as parents navigate this transition and it feels really hard i think it's really helpful to know that it's the end it's not the end of your relationship with your kid it's the end of this chapter and um i think back on how i left for college and what happened after that i um I went to college at 17. I was on the younger side. And um, when my parents were talking about taking me to college, I thought that was so weird. I was like, what do you mean you're taking me to college? Like, you're not taking me to college. Like, I'm just going to go on my own. Like, somehow I got it in my head that, like, you don't go with your parents. Like, you go by yourself. And they tolerated this. They went, I was very steadfast in my mind that I wasn't, they weren't coming with me. So they, like, they put me on a plane to Connecticut at United Air Freight. I had a couple boxes for my stuff. Somehow got myself to the curb at LaGuardia. My grandmother who lived in Connecticut came and picked me up in her um, very smelly station wagon, the Woody station wagon, threw me on the curb at college. I get there like everybody else's parents are there. I'm a little bit surprised by that. Um, but that was how I left for college. My parents like just waved goodbye to me at the Denver airport. Um, and then when it was time for me to go to graduate school, I was like, who wants to road trip to Ann Arbor? <laughs> and so five years later, we load up the family truckster. Here I am at 22. Um, and they helped me put my apartment together. They helped me get set up in graduate school. And I just, I so wish in that moment in the Denver airport where they thought, this is it, this is how we're ending. They had been able to see into the future about what was still coming about our relationship and departures. And so, for parents who feel like this is a rejection, I would just say, this is not the end of the relationship. This is the end of this part of the story. There are chapters upon chapters still to come. Yeah, that's a, that's a beautiful way to, to close this out. And if I can add that it's going to be okay. It's gonna be okay. <laughs> right, that part of it's gonna be okay. And we'll have to do this again where we can talk about why so many high school young women uh, struggle when it comes to looking at college and looking at the future and, and, and being so overwhelmed that it's not going to be okay. And that, and it always is okay. So I've, I've learned that it's gonna be okay and life has taught me it's gonna be okay. This past year has been a really trying year for so many people and we're here and we've endured and it will be okay. And if it's not right now, soon it will be. And for those of you who have loved ones who are going through changes and challenges, you know, we'll be okay. And I truly believe that. You believe that, Lisa? I do. I do. But okay doesn't mean feel good. As long as we go with that definition, it works. Yeah, then it works. So again, I want to thank you. I want to thank Dr. Lisa Demore. You can visit drlisademore.com to get articles, to get content, uh, to get access to the books. And you have so many videos and so much information. And you are truly here in everyone's corner. Thank you for being in mind. Thank you for being so generous with your time. And thank you all for participating in our discussion. I'm Harlan Cohn, this is Before College TV, and I'm grateful to have you here. Thanks everyone.